So it is my pleasure to welcome Ian Hickey to the stage talking about relative path file injection, the next evolution in relative path objects, right? Okay. Let's give it up. Thank you for having me today at the AppSec Village, DEF CON 32. Thank you for having AppSec Village here as well. Uh, I'm a software developer. Uh, I don't work in security. I work in ed tech. But every once in a while, I like to spend some brain power looking at some security things. And the last time I was doing this in April or May, I had a couple of discoveries that I thought were interesting, and I'm going to share them with you today. So many of you know that there's something called relative path overwrite uh, that was discovered in 2014 by Gareth Hayes of Portswigger Research. And relative path overwrite is a way to, uh, if you can inject CSS onto an HTML page, and if a website is um, vulnerable to uh, path confusion, then you can actually get the uh, a default uh, link tag in HTML to uh, interpret the current HTML page as a CSS style sheet. Uh, and under some circumstances, it will execute uh, the CSS. In older Internet Explorer, you used to be able to use things like an expression tag and execute JavaScript from CSS. So it was a pretty, um, it was a pretty interesting way to get JavaScript execution. So what I've been looking at is uh, Portswigger Research has these uh, impossible labs. And one of these impossible labs I've been looking at for a couple years, and I would go back and I would play with different things and just see if I could make any progress on it. In this case, it was, uh, there's context in uh, HTML where you can't execute JavaScript. The browser won't let you. And some of those places are no script or uh, within a frame set tag. It interprets, thank you, it interprets the any HTML that you can inject as just plain text. And because it's plain text, you can't do anything with it. So the first insight that I had into this was, see here, here's an example. You have a B tag, but it's just text. You can't display anything. The first interesting uh, sort of insights I had into this was, actually, you can execute JavaScript, but you would have to have AngularJS installed. And <laughs> you'd have to be using AngularJS, and it's been end of life for quite some time. But it, there is a way to do it. So if you have uh, a no frames tag inside of a frame set tag, and there happens to be AngularJS on the, on the page, then you can just uh, instantiate AngularJS and execute some JavaScript. That's cool. In the original uh, relative path overwrite, if you needed to inject CSS into the page, uh, and again, it didn't matter where you did it, because in both cases, those parsers are not taking into consideration the rules that the browser follows. Angular will happily uh, execute JavaScript anywhere on the page it finds it. And uh, in this case, when it's interpreting a HTML page as a style sheet, it doesn't care where it finds CSS, so it will just execute it. So that was the starting point. And then the epiphany was sort of, OK, well, you can use other parsers to execute JavaScript uh, within these contexts where you're not supposed to be able to do it. So what other parsers are there <laughs> that will do the same thing? One thing to note about both of these things is that they're lenient parsers, meaning it does not matter uh, that there's HTML surrounding the thing that they're looking for. All that it matters is that it eventually finds it. So that was my starting point. What else is there? So I started making a list of all the different types of parsers there are. There's uh, 
SVG parsers and XML and uh, PDF and rich text and markdown and uh, a after spending more time than I would care to admit with markdown parsers, uh, I started thinking about PDF a lot. PDF can actually be handwritten. A lot of people think of it as a binary format and there might be binary mixed in with it, but you can actually just write uh, a, a PDF file and uh, and as plain text. So if you have plain text injection like we're talking about here in one of these contexts, such as no script, no frames, then you can inject uh, PDF. Well, PDF can execute JavaScript. PDF can uh, submit forms. PDF can, there's tons of research into malicious PDFs. So I started playing with it and the second big uh, epiphany that I had that just really surprised the shit out of me is that PDFs are also super lenient because PDFs start with these magic characters and end with magic characters. It doesn't really care what it finds before and after that. So you can actually take this HTML document with PDF persistently injected into it and you can save this as a PDF and it will actually uh, execute. And this is what this is here. This is just an embedded uh, HTML file renamed as PDF and it displays as a PDF and it executes JavaScript. How many people, how are you going to convince people to download uh, an HTML file as a PDF? Like, are you going to put something on the page that says right click here, you know, save it as whatever? They just won't do it. So I started thinking about ways to get people to download <laughs> these PDFs um, uh, without me having to explicitly convince them of anything. And when I started thinking about the original relative path overwrite, which interprets the current page as a CSS style sheet, well, the reason why it does that is because the browsers are stupid. They just, whatever you return back from the server, it's going to use. And if you happen to be using a server that when you add a forward slash at the end, returns the current page back, well, if the current page happens to be, have PDF injected into it, then that's what you're going to get. So that's exactly what I did. And I'm going to show you how it works now. And before we even get into it, just so everyone sees, because it's easier to simply see what's happening than to, um, than to explain it. Someone goes to a website. There is a download link on the website, and the download link uh, happens to use a relative path. Well, if you click this download link, all that's going to happen is it's going to download whatever the file was that you intended to download. And if we open this up, all this is is, oop, and if we open this up, All this is is, uh, you know, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Let's see if I can make that bigger for you. Oh, oh. <laughs> sorry, let me go to oh, oh. one second. Okay, good PDF download. So I've downloaded this PDF and I open this PDF. I'm going to open it with uh, Google Chrome. It's just a normal harmless PDF. <laughs> no big deal. However, all you have to do is add a forward slash at the end. And you notice it lost its styling. And the reason it lost its styling is because now the browser is confused. If you look in the, uh, if you look at what it's actually trying to um, include, as the style sheet, what you find now is it's actually getting the current page that's relative path over it. it. It's confused, so it's returning this back. The effect of that, once it loses its styling, is that if you now click this, 
it's actually going to return the current page as the PDF. <laughs> Which means when someone opens this, it's not going to be the same uh, PDF that, that, that they expected to open. And instead, it's going to execute JavaScript. So what just happened? Where did, where did the new PDF come from? Well, the PDF lives on the server <laughs> because the HTML lives on the server and you've persistently saved PDF content into that HTML page, right? And it's sufficiently confused so when they go to download, it downloads what you want them to download instead of uh, whatever they were trying to download. I mean, this is dangerous. If you think about it, what if this was a, if this was a, a tax PDF site or something? It's not going to be just one link that this happens with. It'll be every link on the page that uses a relative download. As soon as they click it, it's going <laughs> to download whatever that PDF is. So the things that you can do with PDF are pretty interesting, right? Depending on the PDF reader that the user happens to be using. So you have, uh, you have something like uh, uh, Fox Pro, I think it's called, that allows you to do uh, commands when the PDF opens, right? You can execute shell commands. So there's nothing stopping you to simply populate your PDF uh, with a launch commands that executes shell commands as long as the user has permission to be doing it to do whatever you want, right? You can, uh, you can run scripts, you can download new scripts, you can, uh, you know, whatever. In fact, if you want to stay in the web context, I imagine you could probably open a Chrome browser headless with the user's data set as their data and then just go explore the internet as them, right? Because well, why couldn't you? So, so it's pretty dangerous, but, uh, but thinking this through a little bit more, <laughs> it's, it's interesting that you can do it with uh, PDF, and all I did here was this would be, you know, say, uh, say it's a profile page and you have some public, uh, you know, blurb about yourself that you've put this PDF in. Whatever, however you get the persistent uh, content injection onto the page, but as long as it's there in some capacity, then, and as long as you can save it as a PDF, which we can, because there's a simple download link, then it'll execute. So in the original relative path overwrite, what you needed was a link tag with a, relative, uh, with a relative path to the style sheet. In this case, you need a, uh, an anchor tag with a relative path to the PDF. And if it's not HTML, the download has to be fully qualified. Meaning, if you don't have sample PDF here as download, then it won't accept downloading the HTML as a PDF. The, the content disposition will be wrong. So that's the basic requirement for executing this. It has to be a page. So think like, a, you know, PDF library or, you know, uh, places where you can inject content and then it says, hey, save your whole history or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> but this technique is going to be more useful the more file types that we find that you can do this with, right? So, um, so PDF is great uh, if they happen to be using a PDF um, viewer that supports executing shell commands, etc. Uh, but there has to be other lenient parsers and lenient file types that you can use to do similar things. So then I started exploring that. So uh, Gareth Hayes, I was talking to him about this just to make sure that he hadn't heard of it being discovered before either. And he suggested I talk to uh, a gentleman by the name of Orange Albertini, who specializes in polyglot file types. Uh, he's, he's a maven. He's the type of guy that uh, his, uh, his business card, you can put it into a, uh, a Super Nintendo emulator. <laughs> and even though it's a PDF, it'll still play in the emulator. It's crazy. And we were brainstorming other types of lenient file types where this sort of thing might work with. And we went 
you know, zip file types to tar. Tar is another like plain text one that you can sort of handwrite. And it took me down this road looking at that. And while I was exploring it, I was thinking about, well, what would you put in it? Shell scripts. And then anyone who's dealt with enough shell scripts knows that shell scripts can actually be really lenient when they're run too. So uh, what this means is um, if you happen to be, <laughs> what the user is trying to download is a shell script and you have some sort of content injection, uh, you can actually get them to um, get them to download, you know, whatever, uh, PowerShell file or a, a batch file or, uh, you know, bash scripts. And in some Linux distributions, and I'm looking at a, a especially Windows sub uh, WSL2 with Ubuntu, et cetera, uh, with some of these things, it'll actually happily execute an HTML file as a shell script. And it will error on every single line until it gets to something that it understands, and then it will execute it. But if someone's going to a site looking to download a shell script, there's, it's going to say, hey, download this code, and then run it as a super user, right? Because that's what they always say. So if they do that, and, and uh, the link that they clicked happens to have a forward slash at the end, and it's susceptible to, you know, uh, path confusion, et cetera, then the script that they get is an HTML page, and when they run it, it's going to run. And what that looks like is, whoop, what that looks like is something like this, where every single line, HTML, the head, all of it, errors, line by line by line. And then it gets to echo hello world, and it executes it, and then it exits, and that's it. By the time they realize something happened, it's going to be too late, right? Uh, so I managed to get this working with WSL2. Um, I managed to get it working with um, PowerShell, which does the exact same thing, right? It'll execute every single line of the HTML file because it's a PS1 file or whatever. And then it gets to hello, hello world, it executes it. And then it continues, you know, just executing nonsense. The closest I could get it with, uh, with regular Linux shells is uh, you have to be able to inject something right after HTML. So it's far-fetched, but I threw it in there in case anyone has any ideas on how to get that working. Um, I did actually get this uh, similar thing working on OS X and, uh, and Linux if a user's using, uh, you know, Box Pro or whatever it is, because you can uh, have a launch command that simply reads whatever it is in, in its own file and then, you know, executes it line by line. So it, it can be done. It can be done. And so that's, so now we have two, three, four types of files. Ideally, we would have dozens, hundreds. There's so many file types out there to get this type of stuff uh, working well. Um, so I kept on, uh, I kept on investigating other things. Uh, what does not mind there being HTML, right? What will someone simply uh, download from the internet and then throw into something and have it execute, right? So pretty much all server-side uh, uh, server templating languages are like this, right? So, uh, if someone's looking for a, you know, a Ruby or a whatever, a cold fusion script or a, anything else, uh, they're probably going to grab it and then just throw it into whatever it is to test it, at which point it's already executed anything it needs to execute, right? And the cool thing there is that any of the server side languages, they don't, they're expecting there to be HTML. Right? They're expecting there to be all this, uh, all this other stuff in there, so they won't complain. And so these are the ones that I found that it would work with out of box, right? So you have this uh, PHP. Uh, similar thing right here, if we look at this uh, vulnerable PHP. Uh, so all this is going to do, if we go here, 
is it, the safe download. Let's unblock this. Safe download goes ahead and it downloads this uh, PHP file. Open it up. Show you what this it's generated. And what this did is because it's server side, it already executed this, and it says "Welcome user." No big deal. Uh, we do it the other way. Forward slash. All of a sudden, they download it. This time, welcome bad guy, right? So uh, there's nothing stopping you. It doesn't have to be bad guy. It could be uh, read the contents of a you know password file, whatever. Send it somewhere. Anything you want to do. If you can get people, uh, the thing that's sort of insidious about this, even though there's like user interaction that could take place, uh, is that the user's going to a server that's trusted, right? There's nothing untrusted about this server. They've been to it a thousand times. Uh, and they're clicking a download link. There's no difference if that if you were able to just break into the server and replace the file, right? Because the effect's the same. Um, and but what would be really interesting uh, is if you didn't have to do this whole um, download portion of it at all, right? And, and, and that's the hardest part, is how do you get someone to, uh, you know, if someone's going to go download a PDF, click on a link and download a PDF, there's a high chance that they're going to go look at the PDF, right? I mean, that, that's what it's intended for. They're going to trust that whatever's in there, it should be, you make a PDF that looks like a tax document and submits back to your server, whatever. Um, but it would be great if they didn't have to download the thing in the first place. So I started thinking about how that could possibly work. And, and that's pretty tricky, right? Um, but there's been a rise in all of these HTML over the wire uh, sort of frameworks. There's Livewire, there's Hotwire, there's HTMX. And all of these things, what they're doing is they're getting HTML from the server instead of uh, putting all the HTML client side, right? And the HTML they get from the server could be, you know, pre-rendered with like the user's uh, profile picture and, uh, you know, username or something like that. But they're going to suffer the same, uh, the same type of issue if they happen to be on a server that returns the current page when, uh, when there's a forward slash at the end. So, Something like that, what it would look like is so I'm not using any of the frameworks. This is just straight jQuery. Um, but what this does is uh, when the when the page loads, it attempts to um, get some uh, get some DOM element and then inject it into this main div, right? And, and again, it's the same thing. All we're doing is, you know, uh, doing a, we don't need to do this. All it's doing is just, you know, using jQuery HTML, just setting the HTML, no big deal. Uh, and if we go look at what this script does, What's that? There's nothing on this page. There's literally nothing on this page. Um, so all this does is it doesn't do anything initially. Um, you can see when it goes to get the, let me see if I can make this bigger. Excuse me? Oh, got you, got you. So, uh, so nothing too interesting is happening on this page yet. It gets jQuery. Uh, it reaches out and it gets this uh, thing that says welcome user. No big deal. And then it tries to inject the welcome user into the page. But you add a forward slash onto the end and now it actually gets the current page. 
vulnerable HTML. And In one second, let's see what just happened. What did I do? Oh, there it goes. So, uh, so in this case, what just happened is uh, when it reached out to get it, uh, the the ID that it found was for a frame set. And HTML is probably the most lenient parser of all because it has this really weird behavior where if you try to inject HTML tags into other HTML tags that it doesn't like, it'll simply st uh, strip those tags away. And that's exactly what happened here is because uh, when it found It's not letting me leave. <laughs> okay. Whoop. Yeah, so when it found uh, the, this frame set, it, when it injected it into this main tag, it actually stripped the frame set away. So even though the browser is saying, hey, this frame set is completely innocuous, we're just going to treat it like text, the framework itself can take that and inject it automatically. So uh, there's places where maybe you weren't concerned about uh, people getting content injection before, but now you have to be worried about it. And how do you mitigate something like this? Well, there's all the standard ways to <laughs> mitigate it. Like one, you have to stop using, uh, either use a base tag so that things aren't relative. They have a, uh, things aren't relative. Uh, you can make them root relative by adding a forward slash at the beginning, right? Um, content security policy, all these things, you have to do something, but also educating people. Uh, you can't actually trust a file download if it's using a relative, uh, if it's using a relative path. Um, so basic mitigations uh, in place. Um, yeah. Uh, all the all the basic mitigation, so path handling. Uh, it's important to check if uh, the server that you use, you're using is vulnerable to this type of path handling. If you add uh, a forward slash at the end of the URL and it loses all of its styling, it's a pretty good indication uh, that it has this issue. Default PHP server has this issue. Um, I did make a GitHub for this. If anyone wants to play with it themselves, you can find it at ian-hickey. Uh, on GitHub, and yeah, so this is uh, a novel file injection uh, vector. Um, I figured out a number of server-side scripts, shell scripts, PDFs, but there has to be there has to be dozens more if you know people want to explore it. Uh, I rarely do bug bounties because I don't work in security. So I do do it sometimes, but I f it feels like a job to me. <laughs> so, uh, so I try not to. I would imagine uh, there's a number of these vulnerabilities that you can go and find uh, if you're so inclined. No one's ever looked for them before. Um, so yeah, I think, um, I think that there's a lot more that can be done there with uh, the shell scripts on Linux to figure out how to get them to execute. Uh, and yeah, I think uh, if any of you do bug bounties, you should go out and try to find it. And that is my talk. <laughs>